Hello, and welcome to this month's Lunch and Learn on Mental Health Matters. My name is Allison Knight, and I am the health coach for Employee Health Center. So the last year has been very rough, and most people would agree that their stress levels have increased and their mental health has probably declined in the last year due to a variety of reasons. So mental health itself actually includes your emotional, your psychological, and your social well-being. There are actually seven dimensions of wellness, and we often focus a lot on the physical, but we don't talk about the social or the financial or the spiritual aspects of it. All of them need to be addressed in order for a complete and total well-being. It's also a factor in our ability to cope with stress and our resiliency, as well as how we relate to others and the relationships that we create with others and our ability to make decisions. So our emotional health. The ability to manage life stresses and adapt to change. Most of us don't like change, but those of us who work on our emotional health generally has an e have an easier time with it. How you feel can affect your ability to carry out simple daily tasks, as well as your relationships with others, whether that's your significant other, your coworkers, or your children, and your reactions to experiences and feelings can change over time. So things might seem harder one day and easier the next day, especially if you're addressing that emotional health. Your emotional health can actually be improved by emotional literacy, which is being able to name and acknowledge your feelings. Very often when someone asks you, how are you? Your response is going to be, I'm okay or I'm fine. But there's so many different emotions. You might be happy, you might be overwhelmed, you might be stressed, you might be tired. And so actually looking and acknowledging what emotion we actually are feeling helps us become more emotionally literate and also emotionally well. Our psychological health actually includes emotional well-being. Along with feeling good, resiliency, or the ability to cope with and bounce back stress and hardships, and functioning effectively throughout your day for your tasks. Those with a high psychological well-being report overall more life satisfaction as well as being happier and fostering a positive mindset through mindfulness, gratitude, and service can also improve your psychological well-being, and we will talk a little bit more in depth about those things later on. Social. So this is a huge area that we often overlook. Relationships help us navigate the world as well as interact with others, express ourselves, and to be a part of different communities, whether that's work, home, your actual community you live in or volunteer in, and building positive connections and support systems are actually linked to improved mental and physical health. Now, many people have taken a hit with their mental health and specifically the social wellness aspect of their health due to the pandemic and the quarantine and isolation and social distancing and all those things the last year. And it's been tough because we really need socialization. Human beings are social people. We have found that loneliness is a public health crisis. Even though we have all of these social media ways to stay connected, we're not really connecting. We're not creating meaningful and supportive relationships. In fact, a lot of it's pretty negative. And when people are not able to see their family, they're not able to see their friends, they see a decline in their mental health because they aren't being able to be social. And if you think back to living in villages and communities and, and a lot of cultures that still do, the people who are surviving are the people who have a village and a community supporting them and helping them. And being alone or being lonely, because there's a difference between being alone and lonely, being lonely is really not beneficial to our health. Being alone on occasion is, but being forced to be isolated from friends and family and people that we love is definitely detrimental to your mental well-being. 
So some statistics. There are one in five adults who live with a mental illness. One in 10 young adults have had a major episode of depression. This pandemic, it's been reported that over 80% of people say that they have seen increased stress levels or they are stressed, as well as 31% saying that they have seen a decline in their mental health. It's particularly impacting young adults and youth. Suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the United States, particularly for white males. And we've also seen a huge increase in substance abuse disorders. We've already been battling an opioid crisis. Um, in the last year, 71% had a past year alcohol use disorder, meaning that they were using excessive amounts of alcohol or an increased amount of alcohol to cope with stress. And 41% had a past year illicit drug use disorder, meaning they were using substances to help cope with the stress. And it's something that we've seen on the rise. We even saw about an 80,000 um, increase in drug overdoses last year alone. And so these are issues that are being kind of perpetuated as a secondary pandemic due to the actual pandemic. There's actually a variety of mental health conditions. You know, we often think of schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, but anxiety and depression are mental health conditions. Abuse, whether psychological, physical, or sexual. Addiction, ADHD, ADD, bipolar disorder, eating disorders or body dysmorphia. Again, loneliness, OCD post-traumatic stress disorder, self-harm and suicide, and then trauma, which is typically linked with abuse, are all mental health conditions and all things that need to be taken seriously. Mental health screening tools. So you can take a mental health test at the mental health association national.org. If you feel that you have symptoms or have noticed different changes um, for parents too, you can also take this for your children or if your children are old enough and they seem different to you recently, they can also take their own test. I can give you an idea about what you might be dealing with. So a mental health toolkit. One of the first things is probably going to be medication which should be prescribed by a licensed professional and should be taken as prescribed. Very often this is needed to kind of help stabilize and start to balance out your symptoms. Therapy, talk therapy is also extremely important. It should be done with a licensed mental health professional. Typically you want the medication and the therapy in combination because the medication is going to help with the symptoms, whereas the therapy itself is going to help with finding the root cause. Very similar to working with a health coach for diabetes. You wanna take the medication to help stabilize your sugars, but you wanna work with the health coach to help with the lifestyle changes that need to be made in order to help manage and prevent complication. Some online um, mental health professional resources are going to be betterhelp.com and sanbello.com, which is also an app. We also have help helplines for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, the um, Substance Abuse National Helpline, the National Domestic Violence Hotline, and then the Crisis Text Line. If you are struggling or you know of someone who's struggling, these resources are available to you 24-7 to find someone to help you. Now that we've talked about the Mental Health Toolkit, we want to talk about the Self-Care and Positive Mindset Tools. So these are things that you are going to be able to do by yourself to create a more positive mindset and to help with your mental health and well-being. Sometimes some of these get seen as kind of new age or hippie-ish, but they're really quite impactful and often free and things that you can do anywhere that are really going to help affect your mental health for the better. So these include mindfulness, meditation, which there's a variety of meditations available, 
deep breathing, again, a lot of deep breathing techniques, resiliency building, gratitude practice, being of service, digital detox, positive self-talk, yoga, or any kind of body movement in general. Mindfulness. Mindfulness is defined as the ability to be fully present, aware of what we're doing, and not overly reactive to what is going on around us. So it's basically about being in the moment, utilizing all of our senses, which we rarely do because we function on autopilot nowadays, and not judging or reacting, but simply allowing what is to be. It is something that we all possess, but is best achieved with daily practice, just like football or playing the piano. Um, and mindful.org is a great resource to go to to start getting um, some practices and techniques that you can use. Meditation is also another great way to tap into your mental health. There's a variety of meditations available. I really like the loving kindness meditation that allows you to foster love and kindness for yourself, which we often lack in. We don't offer ourselves as much compassion as we can. And if we're not offering ourselves compassion, how can we offer others compassion? We also foster love and kindness for, you know, a loved one, a family member, a child, a good friend. And we also offer it to those who bring difficulty or stress into our life. So maybe that's a coworker, maybe that is a child or a significant other. But when we learn to let go of grudges and not hold negative space and give that person compassion, we're actually helping ourselves. And then the body scan. I really like this exercise. It helps bring awareness to any tension in the body and promotes relaxation. It probably is what it sounds like. It is noticing, you know, starting at your feet and noticing any sensations or pain or uncomfortableness and working your way up through your body breathing into those feelings and sensations and then relaxing and allowing yourself to release that stress and tension. Deep breathing exercises. There are a variety of deep breathing exercises and I'll actually be starting a Breathwork Basics um, series on Monday. I also do have a meditation and a mindfulness series that is available on the YouTube channel as well under Mindful Monday. Belly diaphragmatic breathing. So this is breathing from the diaphragm instead of the chest. When we have shallow and short breaths, this is what is coming from the chest and this can cause hyperventilation. We really want to be breathing from the belly, from the diaphragm all the way down and really allowing our lungs and our, our lungs to fill up and our our um, belly to expand, our abdominal walls to expand, and really get as much oxygen into our body as possible. We also have the 478 breath. Um, this breathing technique can help reduce anxiety, induce relaxation, and help you fall asleep. If you've attended any of my programs before, we have definitely talked about this. You breathe in for a count of four. You hold your breath for a count of seven, and you breathe out for a count of eight, all while having the tip of your tongue rest on the roof of your mouth right behind your two front teeth. And you want to do this for a cycle of three times. And what this actually does is turns off that parasympathetic nervous system. It turns off that fight or flight instinct and helps relax you and bring all of your increased heart rate and blood pressure and respiration rate back down to a normal level. Now breath counting is a good starting point um, because it's fairly simple as far as instructions and actual execution. It's a Zen practice designed to bring your attention to your breath, which is supposed to help you relax. What you're going to do is you're going to breathe in and breathe out and you count at each exhale. So one, two, up to five, and then you're gonna start back down at one. And what this is doing is really trying to bring your focus to your breath and prevent your mind from wandering. If you find yourself counting up to 20, you know you're not really focusing on your breath. 
Though if you catch yourself counting up to 20, then just shake it off. Kindly bring yourself back to where you are and again start back at one. Building resilience. So creating social connections and a supportive network is actually a huge part of building resilience. So that social wellness aspect. We need that community and that support to really feel like we are capable of bouncing back. Fostering self-awareness of our own strengths identifying what we're good at, weaknesses, identifying areas that we aren't necessarily great at or that we could improve upon, our values and our motivation, practicing self-care by, by forming behaviors and attitudes that support our physical and emotional health, finding your why, looking for the meaning in your life and in situations. So maybe, you know, it's your kids or you want to get promoted to a better um, position in, at work or whatever it may be, but finding what your purpose in life is and train your focus to be in the moment and focus on what matters in that moment. And so mindfulness is going to be huge on this. Again, being present, being in the moment, focus on what matters right now and not worrying about what needs to get done tomorrow. Resilience is defined as being able to cope with and bounce back from stress and hardships. It is not a fixed state. You may be more resilient in certain situations more so than others. And best of all, you can learn to be and strengthen your resilience. It involves cognitive, emotional, relational, and behavioral aspects. Gratitude. So gratitude is a state of mind that occurs when we acknowledge the good things in our life or notice little pleasures like the sun shining or a breeze or you know, the taste of a piece of chocolate instead of just hailing it. Um, a lot of times we are so focused on what needs to get done that we kind of forget about the things that we really appreciate in our lives. It's a mindset that you can foster regardless of life's circumstances and you can tune into it at any time. So this is great because even those people who always seem to be down on their luck or like bad things always seem to be happening to um, people can either choose to be upset with it and be angry about it, or they can choose to try to find um, value or a lesson in it. Um, the way that they spin it, the way that they see it is really going to have an impact on their mental health and their physical health. And it is strongly linked to mental health overall life satisfaction and resiliency, or again, the ability to cope with stress. Gratitude practice can simply be, you know, naming one or two things that you're grateful for at the start of your day to kind of set yourself up and remind yourself what you're grateful for, or also as a gratitude journal. Um, and they've actually shown that writing it down seems to solidify and make it more impactful, but it doesn't need to be do every day, um, like every other day, three, four times a week. Um, writing two or three things down at the end of the day, what you're grateful for can have a huge impact on your mental health. Be of service. So the act of giving, whether it's your time or your money, you know, whatever you feel you have to offer, actually benefits you as much as the recipient. Volunteering is good for your mental health by combating socialization, social, social isolation, and depression while improving life satisfaction and your self-esteem can also help you create meaningful connections and promote an overall healthy community. So again, this has been kind of lacking in the last year, but as much as possible, getting out into your community, creating those connections. So you're improving your mental health as well as your community. Digital detox. So this is probably one of my favorites. The image right here. Social media seriously harms your mental health. This is one that I took fairly seriously uh, the last couple of months and the last year. Social media, the news, mainstream media um, have been posting, you know, about COVID and vaccines and social justice and um, the election and all of those things. And unfortunately, it's kind of become a place of hate and ridicule 
and a lot of negativity. And I was personally finding that I needed to distance myself. I needed to remove myself. It was draining. It was not helping my mental health in an already tough situation with everything going on and living in this this weird, bizarre, normal reality. Um, and social media actually activates the reward center in the brain and releases dopamine like a drug. The platforms are designed to be addictive and are associated with an increased anxiety, depression, and then even physical ailments. They've also been linked to disrupted sleep, which is correlated with depression, memory loss, and concentration difficulties. And this can also be twofold impacted because of the blue light of the screens of our phones and our iPads and our TVs and our laptops. So my husband actually challenged me to delete my apps. Um, I do still have my accounts because I do social media for Employee Health Center, but I deleted the apps so that it was harder to access because even with screen time limits and um, app limits on my phone, I was still finding myself clicking into it mindlessly and scrolling for a ridiculous amount of time. And I've probably cut down to less than a half hour a day now, and I was probably between two and a half hours, three hours a day previously on social media sites, and it was not good for my mental health, and it was not good for my time management. It was a waste of time. I found that I'm much more productive now. I sleep better. My mental health is better. I feel happier. I have time to do things that I really, truly enjoy, or I have time to do things like maybe that I don't necessarily enjoy, but like meal prep or cook or clean um, things that really should get done versus sitting there scrolling on social media. So I highly recommend doing this for your mental health as well. And positive self-talk. So this internal narrative uh, can actually have a way bigger influence on the way that we view ourselves than we realize. We may say things to ourselves that we would never actually dream about saying to another person. We're often not very kind to ourselves. We're not very compassionate. So identifying our negative self-talk and making proactive changes towards showing ourselves compassion and kindness can improve our mindset and well-being. So telling yourself that you're lovable, you're capable, you're worthy, you're beautiful versus saying, you know, you're, you're a failure or you're never going to be able to accomplish that or whatever, which we do, um, but being able to acknowledge that, recognize it, identify it, and stop doing that. And finally, body movement. So exercise releases endorphins, or the happy hormone, which acts as natural painkiller. Um, and it also helps improve sleep. And if we're sleeping better, that can help reduce stress. And the endorphins can also help reduce stress too. There's a variety of different types of body movement. I have yoga listed on here. Yoga is my personal go-to. I like to try to do 10, at least 10 to 15 minutes every night um, for my mental and my physical well-being. The link associated with this is going to be Yoga for Adrian, and she offers a variety of free videos on YouTube to watch. We also have the Tai Chi app. So this, again, is just kind of like gentle body movement, stretching, and breathing exercises. We have the Gold's Gym. They offer a variety of Les Mills classes as well as other classes for free. To my knowledge, um, it might be a little bit more limited now, but they were offering everything free for a while. Nike Training Club. Um, they also have a variety of yoga, uh, core work, lifting, HIIT training, um, etc. And for a while, they were offering premium content that you had to pay for. But because of the pandemic, everything is available for free on there. So that's a great resource to check out. And then Johnson & Johnson's 7-Minute Workout. For those of you who say that you're too busy to work out and can't fit exercise into your day, you have 7 minutes. Again, 7 minutes. Take 7 minutes away from your social media scrolling time. 7 minutes to do a workout um, designed as a high interval, high-intensity interval training exercise. And um, I think most of these, or if not all of them, are body weight exercises. So push-ups and planks and mountain climbers, jumping jacks, that sort of thing. So you don't need anything except seven minutes in your body to do them. 
Um, there is another one which I do think sometimes incorporates like dumbbells into it, but that one should be strictly body weight and it is free to use. If you are interested in making a healthy behavior change or looking for accountability, you can schedule a one-on-one -on -one or a joint couple spouses appointment with me using the information below. You can call or text me, send me an email, or schedule through the website listed below. Next month, we will be having a lunch and learn on portion distortion. So how portion sizes have been distorted in the last, you know, couple of decades and how that's affecting our health. Um, thank you so much for joining me this month and we will see you next month.